The Theory of Everything from composer John David Ernest and librettist Nancy Rhodes, who uh, I'm hoping will suddenly materialize here on stage with me momentarily. I could do a little song and dance, but I think we'd rather not have to deal with that. Nancy Rhodes making her way, and John David Ernest. Um, this is not the first workshop of, of excerpts of, of this opera that we've had the opportunity to see here in New York. Um, how long is the workshop process for a piece like this, where, you know, it, it's clearly not just words and music, but visual imagery as well? I mean, at what point, uh, where in, in, at what point are you right now in the production, the, the final production of this piece? Okay, well, uh, the workshopping is a, a sort of a consecutive process. Why don't you take the, oh. okay. uh, the workshop is a sort of process as we go along. Um, we're, we're getting up to finishing the first act, and you saw last year a scene from Act Two. So I would say by, by January, we should have a big chunk of the opera completed. I uh, would say certainly Act One and, and, and parts of Act Two. And by spring, I think we would have the whole count of vocal score, and then JD would begin um, orchestrating. Now, orchestrating this, John, I mean, when Wendy Walters gave Derek Brumel lines like, I know you, Adele, I know you, Charisse, I mean, the, those lines, the music almost writes itself. When Nancy gives you, I had an experience that altered my perception of reality. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? I mean, <laughs> it wasn't easy. Uh, one of the most daunting challenges I've ever had was setting a physics lecture <laughs> to music. And, but there was a lot of there's a lot of information that has to be delivered because of the concept of the piece, and Nancy and I have had our hmm, confrontations about this because, just as you pointed out, many of the lines are not singable in a traditional manner. So I had to find ways to get the information across, but still make a musical line out of it. And certainly in the classroom scene, it wasn't always easy. Um, it was much easier actually with the soprano aria that you heard, the C aria where she tells the story. And, and to set an experience that altered my perception of reality wasn't nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be. But you don't want to, I mean, where there is content in the, the lyrics that's that, that requires a, a bit of gray matter, you know, the, 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 the audience to actually be kind of listening and thinking. Probably not the time where you're going to go heavy on the orchestration. Uh, I would think you're probably looking for something maybe a little more transparent for parts like that. That's true, because the information is so important. Uh, what about Niels Bohr, <laughs> Einstein, and so on? All of those, those words are there, and it's not that they're so critical to the forward motion of the plot, but they, they add to this envelope of atmosphere about the piece. So yes, the orchestration will be light in many places, and then quite heavy in others, because in the second act, um, we have some out-of-body experiences, that are just very similar to what Rachel had, as she described in the C aria. Um, as the piece goes on, it begins to transform more and more, and Actually, I should, this is Nancy's baby wick, I should leave it to her to Well, it seems it. like but, uh, Act 2 last year was a little more, uh, was a lot lighter on the, the heavy science and more into the, the kind of the character study, the development of the little girl, the parents. Yeah, I mean, this scene too that you saw really is the, um, and who knows, we might change things, but that's the, the one scene that sets up the scientific information. 
and 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 then from that point on, it it spreads its wings, and uh, it, we never have anything that uh, detailed and meticulous. But the holographic universe metaphor idea is very very um, fundamental to the foundation of the progression of the piece, both from a scientific understanding and also from what uh, Tomas and uh, the characters um, enter into, uh, especially when his eight-year-old child um, uh, meets up with an accident. And anyway, it figures very strongly, both personally and metaphorically for an understanding. By the way, uh, the holographic uh, idea of the universe, which was put forth uh, by David Bohm and other physicists, is one of the foremost areas that are being researched right now as an understanding of the nature of the universe. And that's right in Brian Greene's book. Well, and it's also in a lot, as, as, you, as your professor points out, it's in a lot of very ancient cosmology as well. And there's, there's a whole question of, you know, is anybody really discovering anything these days, or are we just rediscovering things that uh, were perhaps known thousands of years ago? No, we're just writing operas about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was happy to see, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the dean, I guess, of the part, I mean, all this quantum physics and, you know, uh, Niels Bohr and, and Indian cosmology, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, and he's just an English teacher. Uh, so uh, the, the, the humor that he comes in and says, what does this have, I mean, it wasn't quite that line, but, you know, what does this have to do with physics 101? I mean, there is a sense of play here as well. I mean, it's, this is not a physics le lesson set to music. Right, right. And, well, and, and we're, we're caught in this time period where par paradigms are changing. And, and the classical physics traditionally is taught way after uh, 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 graduate school, so they don't even get the principles or ideas of quantum mechanics or quantum physics until six, seven years into their studies. And as the professor Tomas points out, uh, it, it, this is where uh, ideas and, and philosophy and new age understandings, it's all emanating from uh, ideas of quantum physics. Well, that first scene also set up a kind of a dichotomy between uh, creative thought and logical thought. And this, this of course, for, for artists is a fundamental thing, whether you're writing words or music. Um, although perhaps in music, being a, a more abstract art, it's, it's a little more difficult to define your terms. You know, what's logical, what's a logical progression of chords, of notes, of, of harmonies. Well, but we have to understand that the piece is still found in very much in, and based in human emotions and in human relationships. Uh, the opera is not about physics. The physics forms a backdrop for the spirituality, uh, the interaction of spirituality and physics. But the foreground is definitely about Tomas, Rachel, and their daughter. And what the context of his profession being an astrophysicist does to them. And also what her quest does, as she sang in the sea aria. She's also on a quest to find meaning in the universe. It sounds like a rather simple-minded idea, but it's a profound one nonetheless. And her aria is, is mostly music. The musical vocabulary comes out of my feeling for what she's experiencing. Nothing to do with logic or rationale. Uh, there, uh, but with all composers, there's pattern. Uh, we work from two bases, both intuition and left brain right. activity. So that's always going on. Now, it, when you do finally finish the orchestration of this piece, given the kind of multimedia aspect and the, the sort of high-tech imagery of uh, holograms and quantum physics and all of that, are you looking at a standard acoustic orchestration or will there be some intermediates and electronics involved? There, it will be standard um, acoustic orchestra, but there will be some additional sound elements from synthesizer and um, other elements which I have not yet determined. And some sound effects and sound. And the entire theater 
will levitate. <laughs> Well, you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that for any, you know, moving particle where you can very precisely pinpoint its, its speed, you can never quite determine what its actual position is. So I'm not going to try and pin you guys down to an actual date where this will all come together. But, having said that, uh, it seems like you're pretty far along. This is two years in a row that we've had the opportunity to sample bits of, of the piece. The story is complete, correct? And that's pretty much, I mean, is it like fractal geometry? We get a little bit of it here and it gives us the shape of the whole. Are you asking for the rest of the story? I'm not asking for the rest of the story, just whether this is a kind of representative of the overall arc of the narrative. Well. Last year we did the scene in the planetarium with uh, Rachel, the mother, and the eight-year-old daughter, uh, who's a, a, a star galaxy uh, nut. So we went from that, and then we go, and they're in North America, and this scene that you saw tonight is in uh, Sao Paulo University in Brazil, where Tomas is teaching, and then uh, you saw uh, the ex an excerpt which is, uh, takes place on the New Jersey shore by the sea. So we go back and forth between North America and South America. And Tomas does go into uh, the rainforest in Peru to study uh, uh, with the Caro Indians. And that figures very strongly in the second act. So even, even here we're getting kind of things, little tendrils that will uh, bear fruit, so yes. to speak, later on. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Nancy, J.D., thank you both for stopping by. Congratulations. Good to see still more of the audience.